Massive thank you as always to our top tier patron, Sarah Turner. It's Not Just In Your Head is hosted by psychotherapist Dr. Harriet Fraud, substance use disorder counsellor Ekoi Hero, and myself, the editor and producer Liam Tate. This podcast is entirely funded by listeners, and as the famous meme states, we are critiquing capitalism because we are forced to participate in it in order to survive. So, if you can afford to give, then your contribution will ensure that we can keep making the show. However, if you can't, then please just leave a review on your podcast platform of choice, tell your friends about us, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Reddit, or YouTube. Massive thank you as always to L for organizing our monthly reading groups and episode discussions, which you, dear listener, can join in too. Just head over to our Eventbrite page and the link is in the show notes. Yes, dear listener, it's the moment you've been dreading. However... Uh, if we want to keep making this show, then we need cold, hard cash. So if you want an advert for your listening experience, come join our Patreon. Uh, until then, endure this fairly innocuous advert for Spotify. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money. All in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify, and when you want to take conversations with your friends to the next level, Q&A and polls are the best way to get them talking. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters... Personal statement example, I feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A and polls has let me be creative. On another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. The landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. I'm Mike Kim, and I, I am a Latino-Korean veteran of color who served four different times in the Vermont National Guard in the Marine Corps as a in 4th Anglico Parachute Unit, a Coast Guard officer during the war on drugs, and also served in Iraq in the Iraq War, the recent Iraq War in tactical civil affairs, but with the 3rd Infantry and the 101st Airborne. At the same time, I spent a lot of my clinical work in war trauma, and I've been doing work with veterans since the early 90s. I, I retired from the VA in RCS, that program, Readjustment Counseling Service, in 2018. And I've been at Columbia University doing independent research as well as working on a, a, a doctorate there. I should be finished in a year and a half. The thing is, I'm caught up with looking at readjustment culture, but veteran military readjustment culture, not from just the basic artifacts like movies and magazines, but more looking at what are the day-to-day, -day, like as Walter Benjamin had spoken about the daily lives of human beings. I like to look at veterans in that way, the daily life of the veteran, the, rela the relationships, the intersubjective connections, and all of that. And you can catch my videos that are tied to that at Veteran Etc. And you can Check out cominghomewell.com and you can find my videos there. And it's a great to be a part of the show. What is one of the biggest misconceptions about military and veterans that are prominent on the left? Not only as a veteran, but also as a psychoanalyst going back to the 90s. Yeah, so I've treated veterans as well as been in combat as a regular foot soldier with the 101st Airborne and uh, the 3rd Infantry Division. Having gone back and forth between the, the left and right periodically as a younger person and then being firm as far as being progressive when I, I became a Dominican friar and, and adopted the theology of Gustavo Gutierrez and liberation theology, I ended up like really understanding both the left and the right and the middle or the center. And I think a misconception that the left might have regarding veterans is that we have to thank 
much like the right, we have to thank every veteran for everything that they've done. And my thing is that we all have to have a level of accountability within the civilian world as well as the military world. So in many ways, the left will give this carte blanche to soldiers in many ways so that they themselves don't get involved politically because they just don't feel comfortable dealing with a lot of issues. They'd rather focus on climate change than maybe send an email to the Senate Veterans Committee or something on VA policies on different wars being set constantly. They'd rather do they'd rather do these other things than look at what's happening in the world. And I think that something from the 60s is needed. We need a movement from the 60s. I feel uncomfortable because I know the left at times doesn't treat me all that great, but I believe it's very important to have that because at least America is involved in regards to the issue of military and war. The suicide rate of U.S. soldiers coming back from Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq is greater than the death rate at war, whereas in World War II, that wasn't the case. What is the change in the morale of the soldiers, especially when they get home, that they would kill themselves so frequently? Durkheim did some research on suicide, and he found that World War I vets were prone in Europe to suicide, and it was because of a certain level of lack of integration into society or the bonds have within society broke down for the veteran. There's a British a psychoanalyst by the name of Alec Grant, and I had him on my show, but he had spoken about social death. And I believe an African-American scholar had spoken about that in regards to experiencing Jim Crow laws or slavery and seeing a social death happening with human beings in that. And I think that can happen, that social death happens in a society that only looks at a veteran in regards to thank you for your service and not really giving a veteran a real sustainable job, a real care for sustaining their families, et cetera. I think those are things because when you're in the military to a certain extent, though it's a difficult life, it's a socialized life, right? So you're yeah. Your health care is taken care of. You have a backache. You just go to sick call and they take care of that. You're given food. You're given shelter. After that, then you're put out in this world where it's very different. And then you have the machinery of capitalism, which I, though I believe in, in, in social programs and everything, I do believe that the end of capitalism, or at least how capitalism in its extreme state is expressed here in the United States and in other places in the world, can really damage the, the life of the veteran versus what the media says about all of these veteran entrepreneurs. There are some, I know them, but it's not, you've got all of these veterans really thriving after these wars. Of course, coming from the military where you have tight bonds with the people in your military group, and then you don't, and you don't have support, social supports. But I think, you know, that book by Case and Deaton, Deaths of Despair, that those are social deaths too, that Americans don't have a movement, an organization, a socialist alternative, an inspiration, and are less and less cared for. And so, that I think we all share social death, the way you put it really makes sense across the board, but even more so with the military, I appreciate that. Yeah, what I find really interesting is, and even my psychoanalyst who's very, very conservative, great practitioner, probably one of the wisest men, I've, wisest therapists I've ever met, but even he said that Freud was influenced by social conditions, socialism in a way, not saying that he was a socialist, but he was definitely, he and others, other therapists at that time 
were influenced by the obligations one had to society and to those from war. And he set up free clinics for veterans and for the poor, but he also stood up against the German government in World War I because the German government was basically blaming soldiers for their lack of performance in civilian society. And Freud was very courageous as far as making public statements and standing up against the German military in regards to the German soldier. And, and I'm wondering, people like you, people like me, and then some people from, I guess, the Soldiers Project, the LA psychoanalytic community, have made some impact in regards to politically becoming active. But I think you and I would admit that people in our field have not been active in regards to this social movement that we're talking about, as well as looking at our ethical obligations in regards to holding the military, as well as nonprofits that work with veterans, as well as the VA hospital. I was employed. I was a director at the VA. I was a whistleblower. I love the VA because of the social aspects of the VA, but I have no qualms in admitting that I was a whistleblower and that I believe in accountability all throughout. I think that's really important because our one of the reasons for this podcast is that our field likes to look at everything as if it's just your own personal background and doesn't see you embedded in society. You're being evicted. It's not just in your head. You're on the street. Also, mm -hmm. I wanted to tell you, because I think it's right in line with your thinking, that when I was fairly active in Occupy, there were a lot of PTSD ex-military people there who said this is the most healing experience that I've had since I got out of the military. And I think it's because it was a cohesive social group. So it counteracted what we call social death. Ah, yeah, I think that on the ground, that is great what you said. At the same time, I know people that were caught up with that and they were tied to Vietnam veterans against the war, and then those who set up Iraq veterans against the war. And I will say that while their message is positive, at the same time, we even have to hold them accountable because they have gotten into what I call the veteran profiteer complex in the sense yeah. that, oh, we're going to help these vets, but we're going to get a grant and I'm going to get a job out of it. I can't get a job in the civilian world but I got to get a job helping veterans and I got to help these veterans. And that's what happened in my case where Iraq Veterans Against the War used my address and my personal information and compromised me with my identity to apply for a grant uh, for one of their programs. And when I discovered it, I chose not to pursue legal issues because at th that time I had pretty much just returned from the war. I was a young father and I lost my family and I really didn't have time for that. But now as I think about it, I'm like, I think we all need to just be accountable. And the questions you ask are very important. Can you give me an example of what this accountability would look like? I think accountability would look like, for one thing, we cannot choose sides. Our sides need to be truth, right? So if we see a veteran organization, let's say, and I'm not just picking on Iraq veterans against the war, right? But where were we when Wounded Warrior Project was showcasing all of these veterans on mass media and making an incredible amount of money off of donations? Where was a movement of concerned citizens being vocal, writing articles, using podcasts, doing interviews to hold these groups accountable. So I think that's a start. I think other ways are, they include reporting different things that we see to different organizations that work with nonprofits to hold these nonprofits accountable, as well as the VA. We can always band together as a group, veteran and civilian, and we can always write letters to the patient advocate. We can always write letters, make calls to our representatives to hold the VA accountable in regards to the active duty military. We even have a great system such as the U.S. Constitution that just gives us a lot of power as civilians to contact our representatives, 
to have a commander, if we know the commander at Fort Hood is responsible for that Latina ex-woman who was missing out there at Fort Hood and was dead, was killed, we could have banded together and made a difference there. And so what we need to do is create local movements as well as national movements, much like labor, right? We need to treat veteran issues in many ways like the old labor movement. And sadly, we don't have that anymore because they purposely killed the labor movement in America. They did. But what I need to understand, which perhaps you could help us, is look, Americans, and it looks like Britishers too, although I certainly don't know as much about that, are incredibly passive. I remember reading in Barron's Weekly, that stock weekly of all places, I think the guy's name was Sam Ehrenberg. He said when Bush was selected instead of elected, he said America is a country where you can steal an election in broad daylight. Americans make sheep look like rugged individualists. What is it about Americans now in the midst of more and more misery, not only of veterans, but of everybody not banding together into a vital movement of which veterans groups should be a part, groups against corruption and for socialism or some kind of better society. What do you think is happening that we're so passive on these issues? I see media as being responsible, right? That has become the cult media and the media figures and the this whole issue of the great man. You see a lot of veterans worshiping, not all veterans, I surely don't worship an Elon Musk. But we all know that like the electric car, a lot of those patents, a lot of the research comes from the military, from a collective group of scientists that that it wasn't this great man theory. And I think that becomes a challenge, right? Because when you've got these great men showing off veterans during the Super Bowl or in mass media, we worship these veterans and all of this. Hey, I believe in a healthy admiration, but... When things become so blurred and veterans become the mascots to unbridled capitalism, that becomes the challenge, right? And when you have the media, like Fox News, using veterans and wars and the military as mascots, not to create better lives for veterans or for a better society, but to make money, right, for advertising power. It's really interesting that Actually, the military in some ways functions as a hint at a better structure for society. Because I thought what you said was really profound, that it is like a mini society and that your foundational basic needs are actually met. Maybe just from the outside, that isn't the first thing you think when you think military, right? (laughs) You think missiles, guns, airplanes, all that sort of stuff. You don't think actually... His, as you said, a cohesive social group that is actually, to to a certain extent, looking out for you and looking after you, and so that is a huge fallout coming out of something like that. It's like the end of some sort of long term relationship, but like times a hundred. I imagine. I guess my one of the questions I had was from a layman's perspective. I hear this term trauma bonding. I also hear stories from people in the military who say that there's this bond that you have with this group of people that is like nothing else ever experienced and that there's pining for that maybe when you come home. And so is it, are those things, uh, you know, what, A, I, I wonder what that that is that can't be recreated in regular civil society. And uh, maybe you have to have been some horrific war situation to have that bonding thing and is it different from trauma bonding is it the same thing i'm just glad that i'm with some very sharp people today i'm telling you you're making me really work this friday (laughs) i really appreciate these great questions that that you all bring out yeah so so this is something that i get caught up in, in my research at columbia university i look at a lot of myths and tropes and Right now, I'm focusing a lot on race issues, but in the military. But for a while, I was doing a lot of research in the area of my concept, veteran military readjustment, the 
readjustment culture. And that looks at not just like the movies, like Band of Brothers, right? And I presented this. You can check it out at the University of North Texas. If you look at veteran readjustment culture, you'll find that. I presented that concept at, at their health, their medical school last year, last April. And basically what I'm saying is this, veteran culture, military culture isn't just looking at a movie like the Band of Brothers, right? But we can get caught up with thinking that, yes, we were connected. I'm close to a lot of my veteran brothers and sisters. I can admit I also hated. It's also very human in tribes and other organizations to dislike or to hate certain individuals, because just as much as you find love in a war zone, you also find betrayal. How about these women? And I, my sister is a combat veteran. She was betrayed, but it didn't involve any type of sexual assault, but just a leader betraying her. How does her intersubjective relationships with the command fit in her readjustment? So that's a big question as far as readjustment and culture, not like just looking at the tropes of the band of brothers or here we are together and gung ho and all that, but looking at the intersubjective relationships that you have with your battle buddy, with the enemy, with your command, with your senior enlisted commander, all of these things make a difference. And I would say that when you go through true readjustment counseling, a real combat trauma therapist will not just look at the diagnosis of PTSD and look at the criteria. And when you look at the criteria, none of them have anything tied to a human being as a trigger. And in reality, a trigger, a human being can be just as lethal as an event, as a firefight, as an attack. That very person who assaulted you sexually, emotionally, et cetera, is just as, how could I say, just as impactful as a firefight. And mm -hmm. so these are things that are overlooked in our culture of war, because in many ways, we don't want to look at these nuances, right? When you have certain movies, and isn't it interesting that the Brian De Palma movie, he does a lot of horror, but he did Casualties of War, right? Mm -hmm. When Platoon came out back in the 80s, notice that wasn't as famous, right? Sean Penn was in it, Michael J. Fox, and the intersubjective rivalry of doing what was right in combat and what was wrong in combat was wrestled all throughout that movie. And we just don't have that in literature. Look at the Book of the Year Award in America in 2016, Redeployments by Phil Clay. You don't find those nuances, in my opinion, in these different artifacts tied to veteran culture, military culture. And so when you don't have that, what are you truly being fed? What is society being fed? It's only being fed. Look at these guys as band of brothers and fly the yellow ribbon, fly the flag. And that. Being on the band of brothers, I wanted to ask about the flagrant sex abuse in the military because my son-in-law was in the Marines and he described one night he went out with a bunch of guys and there was one woman and she he took her home because she was drunk and she said to him this is the first time i came home after hanging out with the guys where i'm not naked thanks for carrying me home but he said it was that rampant i read that the most of the homeless veterans on the streets of new york are women who've been sexually traumatized as well as traumatized through the war and i wonder what is the tie between the military bonding and sense of brotherhood and raping your sister. As far as yeah, being part of the band of sisters and, and yeah. brothers. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the command structure and because the command has great immunity. And this is what I've found in my research. There is this immunity that superiors have, right? Where in the federal government or in corporate America, if you commit one of these heinous crimes, you can be personally sued. And not only that, you can go to jail a lot easier. But in the military, 
commanders have a certain level of immunity that guard them from being sued financially. And, uh, and it's also a lot harder in many ways to put a commander into prison. Yeah. So it's the unaccountability because the upper echelons collude in the sex abuse of women. And that's part of it. The other part, and I'm glad you asked this question, and we have a responsibility in the UK and in the United States to prevent these politicians to use the language of wokeism to prevent the DEI, the diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings that have been going on since the 70s. There, there was a DEI Hunter Institute, academic institution set up within research institutions set up in the military back in 1973 because they wanted to avoid all the problems that happened in Vietnam. And what were those problems? Fratricide, where you had African Americans and other minorities going up against the command, especially when Martin Luther King was shot. You had the Long Bin prison overthrow there, the fires and everything that happened there in Vietnam with a military prison. The United States did not want that. The U- U.S. Army in the future did not want that. And so what they wanted to do was look at diversity to, as Liam spoke about in regards to the social, to keep the social machine going, to keep harmony and stability going. And now what we're seeing with these ultra-conservative politicians is a vote to try to kill these programs. And in the future, if we get involved in a war with Russia or with China or with both, we will be seeing, I believe, these challenges that came up in Vietnam, where troops will literally walk out of the battlefield, they will switch sides, they will do many things if it's compromising their civil rights, because we're all human, right? We even had a unit back in the Mexican-American War, an Irish-American unit yeah, called the St. Patrick's, Patrick's Battalion. Battalion. Yeah. They were Irish. They stood up against their command because they didn't want to go through the persecution of being Irish as well as being Catholic. And they did everything that was based on human dignity. And I say this with great pain because I love my country. I love the military. I just want the military to become better. I don't want to see people dying unnecessarily out in the battlefield. I don't want to see division in the battlefield. I joined four times. First time back in 86, I saw a certain sense of growth in the military as compared to regular society. I became an officer. Sadly, I experienced certain things in being an officer in regards to race. But still, I don't think I would have advanced as much out in the civilian world as I did in the military world to a certain extent. And that was happening in the 80s and early 90s. And then I ended up hearing a lot of the language changing recently in regards to this thing, in regards to social improvement, this anti kind of like war against improving society within the military. I wanted to ask you if There was fragging when you were in the military, because I remember during Vietnam, because I'm old, I was very active in stopping war in Vietnam, that there were commanders who were supposed to lead their troops who shot them in the back, and the troops stayed home because they didn't want to do it. They want to risk their lives and believe it. Was that an issue still when you were there? I think that it was, how could I say it? Things changed after Vietnam, as I mentioned, that D-E-O-M-I Institute, the Diversity Institute in the military, and then Admiral Zumwalt in the Navy and the Marine Corps demanding a change of jobs to to create equality in, in, in the different jobs that you could be. Before Zumwalt, if I joined the Navy, I would only, or in the Marine Corps, I would only be a cook or a servant to a, the job classification was steward. Navy steward. And if you're Filipino, Black, Asian, Latino, you'd serve on the ship as a steward or as a cook. Alex Haley was a a steward. He started as a cook and a steward in the Coast Guard. That has changed. And because of that change, the issue of opportunity and the lack of the draft in many ways has stimulated 
volunteer military, where people actually want to be in the military. And in my research, I would say the reason why maybe you won't ha have as much of this fragging that did happen in the Vietnam War is because I read The Colonized and the Colonizer by Memi. And uh, I think it was, was written in the late 50s, right before Fanon's book, mm -hmm. Wretched of the Earth, or at the same time. But it's really interesting because when you look at colonization, and I see it like in the U.S. military, I think on 60, page 65 in Memi's book, he talks about the colonial. And I picture the veteran in many ways, and as well as the veteran of color as the colonial, right? The one used by the colonizers, the big wig colonizers, to send you to, if you're a colonial, to a foreign country like Iraq and invade it and occupy it. And in many ways, re receive some of the benefits, right? Because you're part of the United States military, probably very similar to those who served in the British Army during World War II, or even in the Falkland Islands, where you had a, a recognized Gurkha unit, highly recognized Gurkha unit from Nepal. If you look at, and I've been to Nepal, the lives of the Nepalese. If you're a Nepalese soldier in the British Army, you spend many years away from your family. Your kids, I heard, receive money better. I think they just created it all equal to pay, but it's still more money because Nepal is a third world country, but these kids don't get to see their fathers and they get into trouble with addiction and all these issues. And the price of being a colonial is heavy. And I would say that in many ways, you don't have the fragging because you've got this volunteer military that was set up by Richard Nixon, this volunteer army, small volunteer army that's highly mobile, that accepts all of its good, bad, and ugly, and isn't like the masses, right? Like when it when Congressman, the late Charles Rangel, I don't know if he's still alive, he said, bring back the draft when the Iraq war was started, because then you would see people not getting involved in these wars. Yeah, I saw this short documentary. I think the New York Times did it. It was like a 20-year contrast, I guess. They had video footage of young recruits who were uh, that then sent to Iraq. And then 20 years later, obviously, they're filming those same troops now and just asking them questions. And it, it's really interesting, the voluntary thing versus the draft, because the voluntary thing is, it falls under Noam Chomsky's thing about manufacturing consent right like that they mm -hmm. the military is intertwined with the media industrial complex if you like hollywood is in partnership they make the military look cool and then that sort of voluntary sense of yeah i want to go do it that was very much present it felt like in this film like these sort of young men definitely were like this is going to be this is cool i'm in iraq like in who's gonna how many people get to do what we're doing and then cut 20 years later and it's a slightly different take on the whole thing so i was just wondering for you was when you initially joined was it a voluntary thing or was it because you said like you had more prospects you had more opportunities within the military than you did in civic well, society when i returned to the military there was almost like a 20-year break since the last enlistment it was very different circumstances I had already been working with the military as a civilian with the VA at the rank of equivalent to a captain. And I really didn't care about rank. I was being affected by the patients I would treat who were coming back from the war. I had heard about a classmate of mine. I'm also a graduate of, of a military, of a senior military college. And a classmate of mine had died. I went to Norwich. and. I felt compelled to join, but I gave up my rank and went enlisted us to deploy again, largely because of the news, right? Feeling pressured to be back again because men and women were doing several deployments. My sister had gotten deployed and she was reactivated several times. So that was part of my culture. My immediate 
culture. And I wanted to be a part of that again. But what I recognized was that being a 40-year-old man in a war zone is very different than being 20, a 20-year-old. And so my mentality towards things, my attitude towards things, even my body reacted very differently than these younger men and women. And so I knew what I was getting involved in to a certain extent. I just felt that it was my obligation as a citizen because the numbers were going down. And my recruiter did say I would make a difference as far as having another person not deploy again. At the time I was single, I did not have my son. I just felt somewhat nostalgic, somewhat patriotic, somewhat caught up in that level of duty. But I will say it was also littered with some myths and tropes. Because when I got to Iraq and I had recognized that there was no link to 9-11 and Iraq, and when I recognized that the Iraqis themselves did benefit, sadly, I'm sad to say it, but to a certain extent, through the socialized lifestyle that Saddam Hussein yeah. created for Living Iraqis. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. Christians as well, diverse groups. And I'm not idealizing Saddam, but what I'm pointing out is certain truths that a lot of Westerners, Brits, Americans don't want to face. And that's this was an illegal war in Iraq, and and I was a part of it, and and I got to see a lot of Iraqis in their villages going out on on missions and seeing the Iraq the Iraqis suffer due to the years of sanctions, due to Clinton, due to an invasion that already was with a demoralized, pretty much demilitarized military, the Iraq military, and we just going in there and just pounding them. I wasn't in the invasion. I was caught up in the counterinsurgency, which in many ways was not a real counterinsurgency. And yet I was caught up with the myths and tropes of counterinsurgency. I remember reading and being impressed that one of the things that Hussein did was he fought against the Muslim religious hold on his country and 40% of the professional jobs were held by women which was a real advance. And I think they just wanted to test new weapons on non-white people, which they frequently do. And so I was horrified by that. I also wanted to ask you about another phenomenon that when we visited my husband's family in Mississippi, the only opportunities that seemed to be afforded were, and eulogized were the military, football, and God. That was it. Those were the only things. And he said that in his family, everybody had to leave rural Mississippi or they became an addict. So they'd have something to look forward to, getting high, join, <coughs> excuse me, or join the military. So it was an economic draft and a social draft. Do you, how do you see that? Uh, so what I think is really interesting is a lot of conservative thinkers they forget that the South, the rural South before JFK was, was third world conditions. And if you were black, it was fourth world. Literally, they were starving because blacks back then were not given opportunity for social security benefits. They weren't able to put any welfare benefits because I think if you were a sharecropper or if you were a home aide or home housekeeper, you couldn't qualify for these different mm -hmm. services. And it was purposely set up that way. And so you would have no entrance into the system to receive help. And so what was the alternative? Much like in my words in regards to this social reality. I spoke with Vietnam veterans from the North, from like Brooklyn, who I've done over God knows how many hours, thousands of hours talking to Vietnam veterans who in, from the New York area, some even grew up in, in the, ba the bastion for baby boom, right? In Levittown, in Long Island. One of my sites was in Long Island. So I 
got to get the social histories of these men from the Vietnam War. And to be quite honest, I really honor them because though I don't appreciate a lot of things that happened in Vietnam, my stepmother died prematurely of Agent Orange. She experienced a lot of combat as a Vietnamese woman, a civilian in the Vietnam War. I guess what I'm trying to say is with these Vietnam veterans, they shared with me a level of authenticity as far as saying, hey, when I went to basic training or boot camp, I was with guys in Mississippi and then they didn't even say black or white, but I was assuming it was white, even white, that the guy never even really had shoes on before. The boots that they issued, it was a new experience to get issued combat boots, to experience wow. new shoes. Everything was either handed down or they didn't have shoes. And so those were the type of conditions that were going on with a lot of Americans from the South, as you say, this way out. I experienced some of that growing up in redneck part of Florida. And I didn't pretty much, I didn't have a way, I didn't have a way out. I, if I would have stayed in Florida because of my race, ethnicity, the best that would have happened was I would have gotten a civil service job, maybe with sanitation and that would be a promotion and I wouldn't end it. I wouldn't end up going to Yale and doing the Harvard program and in, in refugee trauma and, and retiring at age 50 and just having a great life for my son and I. It was definitely a way out for me and others. And it still is, right? Like it still yeah, functions. It still That's still a huge part of its function is. It, it offers... is. But yes, it still is. But know this, and this is the research question to be asked. Why is it that Generation Z, kids like my son's generation and even certain younger millennials, you know, they're not going into the military. And it's not because there's so much prosperity in this country, but they're, they're not going into the military in many ways because there's been a shift in culture. What those are, I'm not too sure of. I interviewed Scott Ritter a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. and we did a very interesting video because I wanted to see his life as a veteran. So unlike all of his shows that focus a lot on the present conditions going on now, I devoted that show to look at veteran life. And he explained what some of his thoughts were, and I shared some of mine. And I think he felt that there was a lack of uh, human beings being involved in, 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 in that's present in the military that is not really present out in the regular culture, which is mass cultures focus a lot on the digital realities of the screen, of the phone, of the iPhone, of the computers and everything. And so the military struggles in many ways to recruit because of that. But I also wonder if, because maybe those people have heard the story stories or have access to the internet to, to different histories and maybe don't want to be exposed to what has happened in the past. I'm not sure, but that's some thoughts. I do definitely think that the the image of of the military has changed over time. One of the things living in San Diego, I have treated a lot of veterans in my line of work. And one of the things that they, one of my clients have said was, he was like, oh yeah, I actually hate telling most civilians that I'm a veteran because you become a projection, right? They say, thank you for your service. And a lot of people want to push their idea of what an ideal veteran is on you, right? And so it's one of those things where he's just, regardless of people's of political affiliation, he's, I can't ever win. And when he talks to younger people about, oh, yeah, I used to be a veteran, the older people tended to say, thank you for your service. The younger people are just like, do you have mental health issues? I remembers going to a meeting, right, where he was talking to this. This was a AA meeting that he was at, and he was talking to this younger guy that first time at the meeting, and he tries to like talk to any newcomers to make them feel comfortable so he was talking to the guy and he, and he admitted the and he was like oh yeah i'm a veteran blah 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 and like the first thing the guy said was like he was like oh i recently got diagnosed with ptsd 
And it would be really nice for me to know somebody with that diagnosis as well. He was just like, I hate to tell you, but I don't have a PTSD diagnosis. But I have other diagnoses. That's not one that I personally have. Because despite being in the military, he has never seen combat. And, I think and that's not to say that like combat is the only reason that you get PTSD in the military. Exactly, exactly. The military and like what Liam was saying, I'm glad you mentioned all this stuff because this whole thing of the social reality the military, the constitution even guarantees while you're on active duty, the military, the government is responsible for anything that happens to you. If you get hurt in the weight room, and again, that goes back to the labor laws, the right. labor movement back in the 1930s, right? How many people were dying on the job in, in these construction jobs and all that? So that transferred, that mentality transferred into the military where if you get hurt for anything, whether it's war or not, they're responsible for you. Technically speaking. But I think also from talking to my 17-year-old grandson, my son-in-law's family is from rural Mississippi, and we've gotten close to his grandson. He and his friends don't believe in the U.S. government, period. They don't think this society will provide they think it's going down and there's nothing for them in it. And so that they're not feeling very patriotic, in other words. Go to Mexico or go to Belarus or go to these countries where you have very limited, you have these libertarian governments and see how that compare that to what we have in the United States. That's a, I tell a lot of my veteran friends, you're right. They believe we just need, we just need the roads. And that's it in the military. And I was just like, yeah, you just have a, right there a third world country, what you're describing. Well, I think for them, the general disaffection and dissolution of American society that's happening has affected young people. So they don't feel particularly patriotic. It's like people don't want to get vaccines, even though they're scientifically proven because they don't trust the government wants to make them healthy. That there's a general disaffection, and I wonder if it's in your experience in the military, that disaffection with the whole America. Well, again, going back to mass media, even my son probably knowing about, and I think he does know, I know my friend's son, who's about the same age, knows about a, Andrew Tate, who's talking about buying a Bugatti car that's like a million dollars and focus on being a misogynist towards women and just making as much bag as they say, the rappers say about the money as possible. And you've got these very quick money, kind of internet kind of schemes going on, being pumped to disaffected males, young males, older males, instead of looking at what hard work is all about. And there were times where I had to work two minimum wage jobs to carry out my way of life. And I had to do that. And that was the reality. I wasn't looking at the internet to try to find some kind of internet scheme to look good and get a great car and all of that. And so I, I just feel that mass media has all of these different things that, that kind of preaches a certain type of gospel of yeah. hyper-reality and a hyper-materialism that escapes what human beings ought to be doing. Yeah, and those sort of scam things are men scamming other men. That's the sort of irony of yes. it. That is, that's the bit that's not seen. Yeah, it, yeah, they're scamming women, but, you know, the Andrew Tates of the world are... Right. It, it's, no relation, Leo. Exactly. I've had, to, I've had to do that a couple of times, actually. He obviously has dreamt up this fantastical scheme that sort of operates on this sort of desire level that has just yeah. permeated everything that's that is smart it's evil but he's done something there what a lot of critics haven't said and i want you to go on with that is his father was a very was not just a military chess player he was a very successful attorney in chicago he inherited a certain amount of money from his family that gave him those opportunities, much like Trump and others that have benefited. That's the key thing is that in seeing these media representations, you're always seeing an edited version of reality. Like I, I have a history of 
editing. I've done a lot of video editing. And I remember when certain things clicked when I was learning how to do it, having grown up on media, movies and music videos, I was like, oh, editing is like the 1% of when things are good or they work out. And 99% of the time, things look wrong. Everyone screwed up something or whatever. It's like this 1% thing that you edit into a sequence and it looks more amazing than anything you could ever experience in real life. And the point being is that with these figures, there are resources behind them that are edited out of the story. There always has to be that sort of rags to riches thing that's required. That's part of the myth, the trope and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I did have a follow-up question in regards to all of that stuff, but now it's escaped my brain. But Ikoya Harriet, if you want to jump in, I'm, I'll have to rethink what remember. I was thinking. Yeah, remember it. I do have something to follow up to what Liam was saying in terms of this image crafting. And I think to a certain degree, the image crafting around the military did hit like an ambivalent spot in the early 2000s with movies like Jarhead, which wasn't really celebratory of the military. It was a lot, I wouldn't say it was slanderous, but it was a lot more ambiguous and ambivalent. I'm you know? glad you mentioned that because I actually wrote, I wrote to Anthony Swafford because I wrote a, an article in Mindful Word about that movie. But then after processing it a number of times, a number of times I had to think, Gosh, yeah, we look at the wounded, this wounded soul that's out, out there. Many Iraqi soldiers suffered a lot more than like what we suffered. And I'm not minimizing the pain of war from our side, but it just seems as though our narrative, right? Our war narrative wants to be the gold standard, right? So our sanitized war narrative of Swafford or these other folks that come on board, they have to be the gold standard for describing war. Why can't my sister's narrative become a movie? Why can't, you know, these other Shoshona, I forgot her name from the the Panamanian, the black Panamanian was caught up with on the convoy in the invasion of Iraq with what was her name in the truck. And she was taken prisoner and captive and glorified. She was a white of war, but you never hear of Shoshona and her dealings. And I believe Shoshona actually resisted, like really, really resisted in in that confrontation. But you don't hear about those type of narratives. I have remembered. And it was that in regards to Harriet, you were saying that they're through extended family basically that they feel like the American government doesn't have anything to offer them. One of the things that does happen, and it, Mike's comparison with other countries as like proof of some things clearly are working about the American state versus when you look at other places. And it, there is some truth in that idea that when things work, they become invisible, yeah. right? Yeah. If you have a stone in your shoe, that's when you actually notice your shoes. But prior to that, they were just looking after you as you were walking along. That wasn't what you were thinking about. So it's that thing of everyone has every right to critique everything, but and the state included, obviously. But it's one of those things that clearly some things do work in the States. But And obviously through conversations we've had on this podcast, being in the UK, there's we have all kinds of problems. But it, it's pretty apparent there is some sort of dire issues in America, sort of foundational ones, really, about looking after people and all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting, the military knows that there is a certain basic standard of care that has to exist for the thing to do its job, <laughs> for the thing to function. Right. right. And knowing that, you would have thought, oh, we should apply this to, to civic life, as it were. So then you have to go, well, it must just be a deliberate choice that, that because, like you said, it's part of this funnel this sort of voluntary funnel towards joining the military. And I think also it's really interesting in this conversation, the idea actually may be, okay, if you sign up for the military, chances are maybe you are going to see some and experience something shocking, horrific, upsetting, traumatizing. But the idea that civic life actually be more traumatizing is kind of interesting, right? Depending on the economic and social 
opportunities you might have. The idea that actually just staying in civic life might it, you might experience things that are just as damaging or more damaging. There can be an That's, economic draft too, and a social draft that yeah. lets you join the, the society isn't there for you. But that's a considerable trade-off, isn't it? The idea is, I think, the yeah. sort of common idea is if I go into the military, I might experience some, like you said, this sort of social cohesion, some positives, travel the world, blah, blah, blah. But certainly like a generational thing that might be thinking in their head, yeah, but I might also experience some horrific stuff that's going to stay yeah. with me for a lifetime, whatever. But, or you but might lose I, your life I, as well. You know. Sure, yeah. But exactly. the idea that actually because of the civic conditions in general society, particularly bad, the idea that actually it's not necessarily the worst trade-off. Like that, that's the dystopia, isn't it? Is that every, everything around you in regular life is it's not any better. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Wildcats on Netflix, it's very, very good. It's about a highly traumatized British veteran of one of the wars we've lost, I guess it's probably Afghanistan or Iraq, and how he learns to at least come back a little bit through rescuing animals. So he's saving something's life rather than destroying life, which totally traumatized him. But I don't think a film like that would have been on Netflix maybe 20 years ago, because it very much shows this the mental destruction that he came home with. Yeah, is for you, Mike. What was that? What was that for you? Like coming back, serving initially, and then training to become a psychoanalyst. What was? What did that, all that stuff look like? Is that the right? Is that what happened? I I think with me, I I ended up coming from an educated family, but not an immigrant family. E- economically, not all that, not all that good because my dad was just like in the wrong field. And that's why I don't like Reagan, because he was a veterinarian and a farmer. And agriculture was pretty much small level. Our agriculture in the United States was just like killed by Reagan. And mm-hmm. that affected my father's job. So growing up, yeah, we we struggled. And so the military was a way out. And I had a lot of educational influence or education bred into me from my family. And so that kind of carried me along the way in the military. But I guess the reason why I'm so passionate about veteran care nowadays and veteran advocacy is I had the right parents and I had the right education and I had money and still money as I worked harder as an adult and everything. And I still experienced major readjustment issues after the war. the readjustment issues can be many different things. I don't say that I was a John Wayne kind of guy. There were things that I experienced that no doubt were so different from the person who I had been before. I, before that, I had just been somewhat of a hippie. I had let go of a lot of the military and got into being a friar monk for 10 years and then going back into the military the last time. I had to totally change and revert to something that I was not really accustomed to. And, and that was a challenge. And I think everyone has, and I, as I like to say in my concept of looking at readjustment culture, who were you before you were in the military or before the war? Who are you while you are there in service and afterwards? And, and yeah, I just... I think that there's this really interesting autoethnographic kind of like data in in looking at military service from that angle. And I know I try to look at myself. And like I said, I lost my family. I'm trying to rebuild my relationship now that I'm retired with my son. And that's something that I wasn't able to to be an adequate father to him. I'm not saying that I was an abusive father. But due to my job and being so caught up with being on call 24-7, I, I was not available, I would say, as much as I would like to have been to my son. And, and you lose those years and you can never gain them back. And I'm accountable to all of that. I realize we've gone over for an hour now. I don't know if there's anything 
perhaps that we ha- haven't covered or that Harriet or Eco, if you have any sort of further questions or Mike, if you had anything further that you felt like we have, we've missed or skipped over. Now, there's a huge movement in the United States right now to privatize veteran care. And if we do that, we're going to the welfare of the veteran. You're going to see even yeah. more suicides because we've already started, Trump started to privatize and I've already seen the horrors of it and how he's had these people who know nothing about the veteran world do evaluations on other veterans and they're just making a lot of money as well as insurance companies. And so Suzanne Gordon and Steve Early, they actually write for Jacobin and they've written a lot of books and stuff on veteran care. But if I'd like to steer folks into reading Suzanne Gordon stuff and David Shulkin, who was a secretary of the VA and was fired by unjustly by by Trump. And you can catch my podcast weekly, Veteran veteran etc my name is michael kim mike kim veteran that's where you can look up a lot of my articles and podcasts and i also have a once a month video showcasing veterans of color because i just don't think a lot of americans know much about the navajo code talkers the lido trail based on the bridge on the river Kwai. that Mm -hmm. was an all african-american unit that really built that trail to defeat the japanese But that's VOC, Veterans of Color, and that's once a month. And uh, yeah, I'm really impressed with the show and the questions. And uh, you folks, thanks for having me. I'm particularly impressed by your introducing me to something I hadn't understood, which is the social support network, which is yanked when you leave. One of the things I, one of my clients who have been both in the military and prison actually talked about some of the similar aspects of that experience, just in the sense of he's just in both those environments. You don't have to think about the day to day because the day to day is already planned for you. And that there is, because you've also mentioned like who you were before military and during and after and how those are just like very like different parts of your life and people he also said that aspect he he has that view different views of himself with his time in the military all he also had like the same experience with prison and also one of the things about that he used to constantly talk about with why he failed in civilian life so much, both after leaving the military and both after leaving prison, was that in both those situations, he was like, they obviously prison, absolutely horrible experience. But he was like, I didn't have this unending loneliness in those places mm-hmm. that couldn't be filled. He was like, on one hand, was I absolutely happy to get out of the military or prison? In both situations, yes. But at the same time, he was like, once I was in back in society, there was just like this deep abyss of loneliness that couldn't be filled. And I think that's one of the major aspects of the positives of the military is like this very deep socialization that happens in it. And provision for people, care for people. I realized in my excitement, enthusiasm for, for getting everything rolling at the beginning that uh, I didn't really get in. Harry and Equi introduced themselves, but I didn't get an introduction from you. And actually, that would be useful to cut into right at the beginning of the podcast. If you had a boilerplate sort of intro for who you are and your experience and role and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I think throughout the chat, you definitely got a lot of who I am, but I'll just remind folks, I'm Mike Kim, and I I am a Latino-Korean veteran of color who served four different times in the Vermont National Guard in the Marine Corps as a, in 4th Anglico Parachute Unit, a Coast Guard officer during the war on drugs, and also served in Iraq in, 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 the Iraq war, the recent Iraq war in tactical civil affairs, but with the 
3rd Infantry and the 101st Airborne. At the same time, I spent a lot of my clinical work in war trauma, and I've been doing work with veterans since the early 90s. I, I retired from the VA in RCS, that program, Readjustment Counseling Service, in 2018, and I've been at Columbia University doing independent research as well as working on a, a, a doctorate there. I should be finished in a year and a half. The thing is, I'm caught up with looking at readjustment culture, the veteran military readjustment culture, not from just the basic artifacts like movies and magazines, but more looking at what are the day-to-day, -day, like as Walter Benjamin had spoken about, the daily lives of human beings. I like to look at veterans in that way, the daily life of the veteran, the, rela the relationships, the inner subjective connections, and all of that. And you can catch my videos that are tied to that at Veteran Etc. And you can check out comminghomewell.com and you can find my videos there. And it's a great to be a part of the show. Thank you for your knowledge and your interest and your goodwill. Yeah, that's Thank awesome. You. That's perfect. Thank you very much for doing that in bit because that would be really useful. I'll put it right at the beginning. And the parachuting sounds awesome. Man, someone's going to pay you. To... heights too. <laughs> oh, man, that's amazing. <laughs> Even the military recognizes, right? And I tell this about civil service. I believe a lot of people in the United States, they're against, and I don't know about it in England, but in the UK, but like the, in America, the civil service system is the best system in the world for employment because it's fair. There's actual, yeah. of your man, woman, person of color, you get judged. And I know this is one who was judged and one as a director who had to hire people. There are different grades of different things and you get paid for different risks that you have in your life. So parachuting is extra pay that I said, even though I was afraid of jumping, I, I want this extra jump pay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So did you do a high number of jumps then? Or do you have to, how does no, that? No, I, I did not because I ended up getting switched over to, for officer training and the Marines don't jump except for their special operations and special operations capable unit. Uh, another great veteran, my best friend, Rudy Reyes, just did in the UK, the TV show called Special Forces the world's toughest test. Now, I will say in those shows, and there, I know Foxy, Chris Fox, from ironically enough, when I was a monk, I ran into his friends when I was doing a retreat on the Appalachian Trail. I was just walking, but the monastery was that I was doing the retreat on was right on the trail, but I saw these guys, they were camping, and it was 10 below zero in the snow, and they were camping, and they had been British SAS Marine BS commando marines and i said come on inside have a meal have a hot meal with the monks and actually chris fox from the british military he said he heard about that story 20 years later just to let you wow. know so i really appreciate those brits and like i say i'm critical about, about the military but i don't have hate for the military i don't have hate for military men I just want accountability. I don't want us to turn into a fascist system. I have a lot of love for my brothers and sisters who serve. Right, because, yeah, Go because ahead, e even in a sort of utopian society, there would still be outside forces that might want to attack said utopian society, right? So you're always going to need a defense, right? Like you can mm -hmm. certainly critique the military on ill-advised offense, uh -huh operations but you are even in the perfect system you're going to need defense because not everyone's going to be on board with whatever your political ideology is as a country or even if you could get rid of countries or states or whatever there's always going to be a threat yeah. so what do you do about that that's a bigger discussion but i'd definitely like to ask you more about the monk stuff as well because that sounds really interesting but yeah we've hit, hit the clock we can talk about the social aspects of monastic life, something I picked up on while I was in the monastery. I'd also like to hear about your time in the Coast Guard with yeah. the drug war. We might have different views on that, but that's totally fine. I, I am all about having that budget being spent on 
recovery. I also worked in Harlem during the crack epidemic of the 90s and the Clinton crime bill and welfare reform with families. Again, we'd love to have you back. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Rebecca Johns, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Alexander Lashley, Sheena Belmas, Seamus O'Connell, Alex Placito, Alexandra McCormick, Wig Shaker, Elizabeth McKechnie, and Sean Venado. By the way, listeners, if you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolf and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And if you want to hear even more from Harriet, check out her radio show, Interview personal update on WBAI and in the WBAI archives.